And we can talk about that. My interpretation was that this related to uh, the schools in terms of what we're offering to students, or related to how the town uh, is doing things going forward, and just thinking forward about what our needs are going to be in the future. And there was a very strong feedback on this. Um, retaining staff. I apologize, I see a six ahead of a seven here in a couple of cases. Um, retaining staff, again, both on the school side and the town side. This was an issue that came up, because I remember um, we kind of had gone through the priorities, and then this came up, and a number of people kind of shifted their voice as a result, feeling this is very high priority. Active economic development, technology, proactive planning, in terms of where we're headed, free full day kindergarten, and then on the smaller numbers, but still the registered, solar incentives, and funding for the uh, RAD program. What I did here is I took the financial forum votes and I kind of added the town department head votes. So you can see just by comparison, there are obviously there are many fewer department heads. But the funding innovation or innovative ideas toward 2020 was a very strong priority for everybody. And that's very, very important in the Next slide, please. Okay, service is getting more funding than they should be, or better solutions are needed. So this is kind of that third category. So what you can see here is there is a lot of discussion about partnerships, collaboration, regionalization, and trying to think if there are ways that we can do a better job with this. It came up as kind of a huge priority in the list and the numbers of just about everybody. Um, shift in library programming. Again, I, I think I've, I've let the group um, talk a little bit more on that. I think, again, it's thinking all things toward 2020 and beyond 2020, uh, making sure that we're, we're thinking about where our priorities are set. Um, plant watering and pruning is an idea that, that was brought up and looking at the town's priority uh, as far as what that is, what the plan is, and how important that is to different people. Uh, an interesting thing that came up on both sides. Student health and social issues. So the discussion here was about outsourcing those services. And again, thinking here on the latter side, better solutions needed. That was the discussion here. Are there ways that we might be able to do that? Is that a better solution? Finding more grant funding. I think is a priority that will always be with us. We're thinking about how we might do that. Um, and last but not least, there was an idea on snow plowing and removal of snow for businesses, which I know is, is something that um, Reading does, and it isn't necessarily done by uh, other towns and cities in the Commonwealth or, or elsewhere. So that's something that came up and we discussed a little bit as well. <coughs> From here, let me turn it over to Bob to talk about uh, follow-up and then also the fiscal 16 budget. Um, thanks, Mark. The Board of Selectmen, uh, sometime starting at the beginning of the summer, created four working groups. You can see the list of our care community partners, a way to inventory and measure uh, our services, uh, a focus on communication, and then the fourth one is sort of broad, it's strategic planning, which has many different components to it. Um, the selectmen and the uh, town department heads are working on all these issues. Uh, the selectmen are also working on annual goals that they will vote on uh, likely at their next meeting in September. Um, for those of you that went over to uh, Jackie Carson's place, and thank you again for hosting, we had a really nice series of meetings about economic development. Um, we had a Professor Barry Bluestone from Northeastern <coughs> Dukaka Center come in and independently with outside eyes assess the town relative to many other cities and towns that he studied in the past. And he had some really very powerful suggestions. And at least the things I found most interesting are the things that we think we're doing well and are important. We are doing well, but not that important. So you, know, you want to focus your energy on things that matter. And then lastly, um, right now, I'll give you a little bit of an overview of the budget process. And this is mostly designed with the three gentlemen behind me to make them understand the need <laughs> um, the Finance Committee last year used a historically high amount of free cash to balance the operating budget, $1.7 million. Um, it is very likely that this year we will still have a good cash number, so we can do that again. So I assume for now that the Finance Committee will have a similar opinion in the next two years. And we've talked about trying to do a two-year budget just for planning purposes. It, it may not be perfect. But if we do use 1.7 million of free cash for the next two years, we take an assumption uh, on revenues, which we generally do, and that includes a 2.5% increase on local aid, which is a little higher than we got last year. We then take in all the costs, some of them are fixed costs, such as debt and capital. Some of them are listed here. Um, unfortunately, drive some of the costs higher. 
health insurance premiums were going out to bid this fall. That's usually a good competitive situation where you get a good deal. Unfortunately, the marketplace doesn't have a good deal in health insurance right now, so we'll see. But some of these so-called fixed costs are increasing at 6%, which is far higher than our revenue rates. So the result of all this, you put it all together, even though you're using a lot of free cash, we've had operating budgets in the 3.5% year by area for four to five years now. The next two years look like about 1%. So it's just very difficult. And that's, that's not getting into what services are important, not important. That's just how much money you have to even start. You have 1% more than you had last year. So to the extent the services cost 3% more than they did the year before, we can't have as many services. So I just wanted to give that um, quick overview of the budget for everyone to hear. And um, I want to remind everyone, there is a sign-in sheet at the beginning. We can pass that around if anyone missed it. We'd really like to make sure we know who's here. There's plenty of drinks and snacks in the back. Uh, feel free, it won't be rude at all. Go back there as often as you like. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our three representatives. Um, Senator Jason Lewis, Representative Bradley Jones, and Representative Jim Dwyer. And I especially want to say two things. One is, uh, it's a pleasure to work in Reading, and these are three of the reasons right here. Historically, Reading has had extremely strong representation at the local level. We're very, very fortunate. Not other communities are as fortunate as we are. And moreover, for Franklin and Maine, we were going to give you a uh, huge prize tonight, but we couldn't find it. Fred couldn't come. <laughs> I'm sure it's coming in email number 45. <laughs> I'm sure it is. I spoke to Fred on Sunday. He was at the Fall Street Fair. I asked if he could come tonight, and we make a big presentation. He said some of the time. Um, but just on behalf mostly of Fred, but partly the rest of us. There's a lot of people. Um, thank you for answering all of Fred's questions and slowing down his email barrage. Um, <laughs> he calls me direct. <laughs> He used to try that for me. Uh, the improvements in Franklin and Maine, I know, Brad, you commute there every morning. Uh, I don't as often. Seem remarkably better. Yes. Um, and Chief Cormier can attest to that as well. Um, it's, it was a simple sort of grassroots solution. It didn't need to be overly engineered. It was just a nice example where good old-fashioned government can work in a timely way. So I want to thank you. Um, and at this point, I'll start with Senator Lewis. Uh, if the three of you want to make any opening remarks, there's a bunch of questions and sort of areas of discussion up there. And you can just turn it over to the questions in the audience. Mm -hmm. Up here, Bob, is that okay? Please do. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Are these mics live on PA? Senator for the town of Reading. Um, I uh, appreciate having this opportunity tonight to spend with all of you to uh, share information, to share ideas and, uh, and feedback. I do want to, before I start, just introduce uh, my chief of staff um, who's joined us tonight as well, Laura Richter, or if you could just stand up. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura, for joining us. Laura's actually been with me. I served as a state representative um, for about five years before becoming state senator, and Laura was there for most of the time. So she knows uh, you know, everybody uh, on Beacon Hill and how to navigate uh, all the tunnels and pathways and uh, challenges. So um, she will be somebody who will be working very closely with you and hopefully in the months and years ahead. Uh, I appreciate and understand uh, the challenge um, that you face as uh, local elected officials. I know the members of the Board of Selectmen are here, school committee, library trustees, and of course the finance committee. And uh, the reason I understand that is because I got my start in public service, uh, maybe uh, it's eight years ago now, as a member of the finance uh, committee in the town of Winchester. So I've sat through the endless meetings and budget discussions and spent time sitting with the police chief and the fire chief and going through all their budgets. And I know how challenging it is um, particularly in the era we live in when uh, we have such scarce resources and it's so hard to, um, you know, to balance the budget uh, every year and, and what you shared with us, Bob, is something I'm very uh, familiar with. 
Um, I see uh, my role as, the, uh, as your state senator as being a partner, being your partner in trying to support the needs of the community um, and to improve the quality of life uh, for the residents of the town of Reading. And, and in particular, that means doing everything that I can, uh, along with um, the fine uh, legislative delegation that we have for the town with uh, Representative Jones and Representative Dwyer, to look at all, at all sources of uh, state funding for the town. Of course, the big ones like uh, Chapter 70 for school funding, Chapter 90 for roads and bridges, unrestricted local aid, but also any other possibilities um, uh, that we can tap to support the budget needs and the uh, service requirements you know, here in the, in the town. So uh, working um, uh, closely with um, my colleagues, uh, Representative Jones and Dwyer, and by the way, um, from serving in the House, uh, we actually had a chance to work together for many years, so we know each other very well. And uh, in fact, um, Representative Dwyer and I actually used to represent the town of Stoneham together. I had part of Stoneham and he had another part. So uh, we've been in the trenches together, spent a lot of time. Um, they're uh, terrific uh, legislators, and uh, I've seen the work that they've done serving their constituents, and it's really an honor for me to be able to work together with them. Um, so uh, I wanted to do four quick things. The first is just a few, um, I think, of some of our um, uh, successes uh, in the, you know, this year so far that we can celebrate. Um, second is touch on uh, uh, what I think is the biggest challenge to our local budgets, which is health care, health care costs. Uh, third is some um, ideas I want to share with you in terms of potential uh, creative opportunities to bring additional uh, funds into the town, whether that's state money or federal money or other grant money. And then lastly, I just want to touch on OPEP. Um, obviously, post um, um, generally, uh, uh, it's not only, but largely uh, retiree health care benefits. Um, so those are the four things I want to touch on. I, I, I will try to be brief because I know we've got a lot to cover tonight. Um, so in terms of some of the things I think we've uh, already been able to work on together, um, Bob mentioned one of them, of course, the uh, intersection of Franklin and Maine. And, you know, to me, um, as a lawmaker, you know, I do have to get involved in some very, you know, uh, large issues, whether that's, you know, uh, the minimum wage or what we do with education policy. But at the end of the day, the most important thing that, uh, that I do as a lawmaker and my colleagues is the bread and butter issues. And it's exactly like what we are trying to do, you know, to improve public safety uh, on Main Street. And so I'm very pleased. Um, you know, most of the heavy lifting, of course, was done by the community and the Board of Selectmen and Representative Jones and Dwyer, but um, I'm happy to um, have uh, played even a small part in moving for that project forward. And uh, it is now in phase two, and Mass uh, Department of Transportation is committed to finishing that um, in the near future. Um, we um, also, um, uh, recently, the, the Reading um, Muni uh, was, was awarded a $250,000 grant um, for energy efficiency and energy conservation programs. Um, so we're, um, you know, we're pleased about that, and they're putting that, some of that, most of that money is going to uh, Reading, but some of it's also going to the other communities that the Muni serves. The uh, Reading Cultural Council recently was awarded almost $6,000 from the Mass Cultural Council to support local culture and arts programs in the, in the community, and we know how important those are to the quality of life and also to the local economy. Um, and then my favorite, a, a $7,500 grant from the Civil War, and I, I'm, this is the hardest word to pronounce, the, the Sesquicentennial Commission, uh, right, right? Uh, what's that? that's 150 years, for the uh, Civil War preservation of the uh, gravestones and markers, and uh, uh, we know how important it is to honor our veterans, um, and so I'm pleased that that even though it's a modest amount of money, is going to help to make that happen um, here in Reading. And then uh, lastly, I, I just want to mention something that's been um, the number one priority for me since I entered the legislature as a state representative and now as a state senator, and that's uh, adequate and equitable funding for our public schools. And that's largely determined by the Chapter 70 formula. Um, one of the uh, strategies that, uh, that I've been pursuing for a long time um, is to update the Chapter 70 foundation budget. The foundation budget is the calculation that determines how much each school district uh, in the Commonwealth requires in order to uh, educate the students that that community serves. And that foundation budget is largely out of date, doesn't accu accurately reflect uh, health care costs, technology needs in our schools, uh, special education needs, and many others. And we have some very good news on that front. 
Um, after working on this for many years, the, F, the fiscal year 15 state budget, um, thanks to the um, efforts of the Senate and the, my colleagues in the House, includes a foundation budget review commission. And that work is about to begin, and they are charged with looking at um, what we need to do to update the Chapter 70 formula. And I'm, I'm hopeful that that will be the, the, a very important first step to ensuring that the formula really does truly reflect you know, the actual needs of our schools and our communities. And that would go a long way toward addressing some of the, the fiscal challenges that um, Reading and many other communities are facing. All right, second then, in terms of uh, health care and, and uh, the unsustainable rise in, in health insurance costs, um, this is actually the, uh, other than education funding, this is actually the second area uh, or my uh, other priority that, uh, that I've pursued in my time in the legislature. I served for a number of years as the vice chair for the Public Health Committee, um, and I'm very active on health care policy. Um, the state um, has actually been doing a lot of work in this area trying to rein in health care costs, trying to find strategies to make health care accessible to all but more affordable. And there have been a number of uh, initiatives over the last six, eight years. But I think the most significant was the 2012 payment reform law, um, which many may have heard of but not be all that familiar with. It's a, that in and of itself will be a whole presentation tonight. But suffice to say, there's a number of strategies included in that law to change the way we pay for health care, to encourage a focus on quality care and on outcomes rather than fee for service, um, and a number of other strategies to um, rein in health care costs uh, over time. And we've started to see some benefit of that already, although there's a lot of work still to be done. One specific element of that strategy that I focused on is how do we bring down rates of preventable chronic diseases one of the things that's really driving healthcare costs is the growth in uh, diseases like type 2 diabetes, certain forms of heart disease, cancers, and stroke that are entirely preventable, um, but because of um, unhealthy um, living conditions and, uh, and decisions that we make, um, we have seen a, you know, a rising incidence of these kinds of diseases. So we were successful in that law in creating a first in the nation prevention and wellness trust and that is actually going to be investing $60 million uh, over the next four years uh, on community-based health and wellness programs. Uh, so that's going to be in our communities, and that's directly to address these preventable health conditions. And I think that's a strategy that will improve people's quality of life and productivity, and also will be a, a, a key element in our battle to control health care costs. Um, I fully understand how challenging that is at the municipal level and how much of the budget is eaten up by the increases in health insurance costs. By the way, the exact same thing is true at the state level. Um, the reason, for example, that um, local aid or unrestricted local aid um, hasn't increased as much in the last year or two as the state budget has increased is largely due to the fact that so much of the increase in revenue is being eaten up by health care costs. So the same problem we have at the local level is the one experienced uh, at the state level. So it is imperative in terms of our local municipal budgets, our state budget, our businesses, particularly our small businesses and our families, that we do more to um, rein in uh, the rise in health care costs. So third, um, some of the ideas um, and opportunities that are out there that I think you um, may already be looking at, but if not, I would be um, excited to partner with you uh, to look at these opportunities. Is, uh, first is something that uh, is referred to as complete streets or also referred to as active streets. And the notion is that um, you know, if we can think about transportation as more than just moving cars, uh, but also how do we move people safely, pedestrians, um, bicycles, um, make better uh, access points to public transportation. Reading is very fortunate to have you know, good public transportation with commuter rail, and how do we take advantage of that? Um, so in the uh, transportation bond bill, um, the same bill that included a million and a half dollars for the Reading improvement for the uh, intersection on, the, on Maine, Franklin and Maine, we also included in that bond bill some legislation that I had filed to create an active street certification program. And the idea here is to provide a, a separate pot of money, this is not taking away from existing Chapter 90 money, but it's a separate pot of Chapter 90 money that will be available to communities that become certified as active streets communities. So there's a certain series of steps that the city or town will have to go through to demonstrate a commitment to complete streets, and then they will then qualify for this grant money. 
And the good news is that, is that the Patrick administration has already taken steps to set up a $5 million uh, grant program now that the legislature has authorized it. And I've already been speaking to, to Bob and to Jean um, about the potential for Reading to pursue this, because I think Reading is an ideal uh, candidate to, um, to be in a, in a program like this. And it will, it will basically support the efforts and the initiatives that you are already looking at, you know, particularly uh, in, the, in the downtown area along Main Street. So uh, hopefully more to come on that. Um, second is the Green Communities Program. Um, I don't know if you've looked at this uh, in the past. Uh, it's a little more complicated for Reading because you are a muni community, um, but it doesn't mean you can't become a green community. There are now um, 123 municipalities that have been designated as green communities, and by doing so, you qualify for funding from the REGI program. That's the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative that we participate in and our utilities pay into. So the money's out there, and it's going to communities that are designated as green communities. The money gets used for energy conservation and energy efficiency programs, so then you get a virtuous cycle because that really lowers operating costs in your municipal buildings and your schools. Um, so the communities, uh, Melrose is a green community, Winchester is a green community, uh, have had great success with this, and I don't know if you've looked at it. Um, again, it is a little more complicated because of being a uh, muni, but it um, doesn't mean you can't, and I would be um, very happy to work with you on that if that's something you want to explore. Um, third, uh, I would mention, this one is always a little tricky one, um, but it's the Community Preservation Act, or the CPA. Um, and uh, that is something, again, that is state money that's out there. Um, it's Reading residents that are paying these fees to the Registry of Deeds. Um, that's where the money comes from, in addition to additional state funding that's typically allocated at the end of the year from surplus money. And it's, about, it's out there for communities that have adopted the CPA, and it can amount to hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Uh, it can be used for um, open space and recreation, um, and there was a recent change in the CPA to allow it for existing playgrounds and ball fields. You can use the CPA money to improve those, which was a recent change in the law, and I think would benefit particularly a community like Reading, which is you know already built out. You're not building new ball fields, you're trying to improve the ones and the playgrounds you already have. It also can be used for historic preservation, I know how important that is to the town, uh, and affordable housing. So that's again something that if you're interested, uh, we, my office has a lot of expertise on that and uh, there are resources out there that could, could help you on that. And then lastly, um, in the work that I've done, I mentioned a lot of my work has been in healthcare and in public health. Um, there's something called the Mass in Motion Program and um, I was successful in the state budget recently in securing um, $250,000 for the Mass in Motion Program. And um, Malden, uh, Melrose, and Wakefield are all participants in that program. And I thought since Reading shares a public health director with uh, Wakefield and Melrose, um, it would be logical to look at um, Reading also becoming a, a member of that program. It, it supports initiatives like healthy eating, farmers markets, um, restaurants having um, you know, menu items that are healthier, and also healthy living, uh, active living in the community. So uh, the best example of this is Shape Up Summerville, which is actually a national model for um, encouraging healthy living They've actually seen their child uh, obesity rate go down you know, as a result of, the, of their program. And that will have a direct impact on, on their costs and on their quality of life. So if any of, if any of those are of interest, I would be welcome the opportunity you know, to partner with you and work on that together. All right, then uh, number four, just very briefly, um, OPEC reform. Um, so this we're talking about is obviously uh, a huge challenge for, um, for Reading and our municipalities as well as the state. Uh, which is what do you do with retiree health care benefits? The promises that have been made to current retirees and to you know, current employees for when they retire. And, uh, and it largely, this is a bigger challenge uh, that we're facing than pension obligations. I would argue it's a far bigger challenge to our budgets and our fiscal stability than our pensions are. Um, so there's been a lot of thinking on this area at the state level. There was a Blue Ribbon Commission that filed a report on this. Governor Patrick then filed legislation in this current legislative session to, to uh, start to address OPEB reform. Um, I'm actually the chair of the, the Senate chair of the Public Service Committee, and this, this issue is within the Public Service Committee. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough time this legislative session to really move on the legislation, but I do expect this will be a high priority in the next legislative session beginning in January. So some of you may have received an email from me just a little while ago 
um, after a meeting I had with the, um, the Mass Municipal Association, with their personnel committee, and I would be very interested in uh, getting more of your input and feedback on how the retiree health care benefits and OPEB liability affects the town of Reading specifically, and what sorts of ideas you have to reform um, OPEB. There's obviously very important questions of grandfathering, and how, you know, how, do we, how does it affect current retirees versus future retirees, but that's what we need to consider, and I really want to gather your input now in the, in the months ahead, so when we go into the next legislative session, if I'm fortunate enough to continue to be your state senator, we can hit the ground running, and we'll be able to hopefully make headway uh, next session on, uh, on OPEP reform. All right, so that's about it. I just want to uh, mention um, a quick um, uh, uh, announcement, if you will, uh, for two, uh, uh, forums that uh, that I'm sponsoring that are coming up in September and October, and it would be great to get participation from um, the Board of Selectmen, the School Committee members, the Finance Board, as well as members of the public. The first is on education funding. So I touched on Chapter 70 briefly, and I talked about the Foundation Budget Review Commission. It's actually a very, I think, very interesting topic. Um, maybe not everyone shares my uh, interest in that, um, but it's also uh, very important and it's quite complicated. And we're doing a forum on that in Wakefield, and, uh, along with the Massachusetts Budget and Policy Center. And the date on that is September 24th at Wakefield High School. Um, so don't worry, you have to write that down. We'll get that information out, out to everybody. But that will be a good opportunity to learn more, both about how the system works today and how we're looking to change it and reform it to ensure more adequate and more equitable funding you know, for all of our public schools. And then second, very excited about an event we're gonna be doing in Reading, and I'm gonna, uh, this one I have a, uh, an invite for, and I'll, I'll circulate that. And that is a regional dialogue on opioid abuse. Uh, we all know how huge a challenge that is in our communities, particularly with our young people. Um, you know, substance abuse and mental health issues, I think that was on the list that you had up. And uh, uh, for this, I'm partnering with the uh, Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse. They do such a fabulous job. And also the Mystic Valley Public Health Coalition. And that's going to be on October 23rd at Reading High School. And I'd uh, love to have your participation in that. That's going to be a really interesting program. Uh, come prepared to roll up your sleeves because we're going to have a group facilitated process and uh, we're all going to participate in that and try to come up with some good ideas and solutions. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate uh, tonight. Uh, I'm sorry I went on so long. I know it's my first time meeting many of you. I promise I will be a lot briefer next time. Um, I do look forward to the conversation tonight and to learning, listening and learning uh, more about the challenges facing the town of Reading and how I can be uh, your partner going forward. Thank you very much. Hey folks, my, my name is Jim Dwyer, obviously, and uh, I'm, I'm going to give you the Gettysburg Address. And, uh, Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, Jason just about went from A to Z on all the issues at Beacon Hill. We appreciate that, Jason. Um, as a former uh, alderman, and uh, for, for almost two almost two terms, uh, I'm very, very sensitive of uh, the money that's coming back to the cities and towns and for your operating budgets. Uh, I think our job, first and foremost, is to public safety, number one. But number two is to make sure that we get every bang for our dollar and back to our communities and make sure that the quality of life in our cities and towns and the educational process is something that's fully funded. Um, it may be blasphemous to say this, but there was a couple issues in the, in the legislative side this year that I thought we could have uh, passed and we didn't. Uh, one was the municipal gas tax. I know the DPW commission is very concerned about that, and that was something that uh, you know when we fail to send back the appropriate money, there's, there's ways that we can do to make sure that your money stays into your coffers, and, and certainly the municipal gas tax is one of those issues that that I felt as though, and I voted for it uh, to make sure that the cities and towns uh, retain and save that money. Um, another issue was uh, I did file a bill uh, this past year was unfunded mandates especially for schools, in uh, Chapter 7. So uh, the unfunded mandates were, you know, you burdened by it. I heard that from our, our school committees all the time, our superintendent of schools. 
and I filed a bill that uh, was unsuccessful, was sent to study, which is the mortuary of the, uh, the state house. And uh, to make a long story short, that would have had, uh, obviously, not to send any mandates back that weren't unfunded. And if they weren't unfunded, then, then there would be a commission to find out exactly what the situation was and how we were going to store some kind of funding to give the cities and towns uh, the benefit. Uh, the other uh, bill that did not pass in the, in the legislature this year was uh, our colleague Brad Jones, uh, during the budgetary uh, situation, wanted was uh, we sent back $25 million extra dollars to the cities and towns this year. Uh, Brad filed a bill that uh, would have upped that to $50 million. And unfortunately, that did not pass either. So, uh, all in all, I think the legislature did a good job as far as uh, the budgetary process, uh, taking care of uh, the things that, that need to be taken care of on the, on the local side. But there's things that we, th we can do, I feel, is a lot better. Uh, because you, as, on, as an alderman, and you folks know what's best how to spend your money, not us. So that's why I want to make sure that we have as much money to come back to city towns as is absolutely possible. So that being said, I'm going to uh, listen and learn and take any advice and make sure that I bring the message back to my colleagues and uh, to make sure that we can do, do whatever we can to make sure that your budgets, uh, and by the way, I know Bob is very concerned and all the budgetary people is, uh, during budget time, that uh, we, we should you should have your number in March or early April, and uh, for that not to happen is, is pretty egregious. Because I know we can do that, and I think we did a good job this year as far as getting that number out. So that was something that uh, will certainly help uh, all all the communities we have through your budgetary process. So I appreciate being here tonight. Um, again, uh, I think I'm very accessible. And if you have any questions, you want to meet me at any point in time uh, during the course of the coming days and the into the budgetary period, I'd be glad to do that. And thank you very much. Thank you, Jim and Jason, and thank you uh, for all being here tonight, and thank you for your service. Uh, I got my start um, on my housing authority, and spent six years on my board of selectmen, uh, four years on my finance committee, and then on a fiscal affairs advisory committee. Um, so I appreciate that the things that we do and don't do at the state level have meaningful impacts at the local level. Um, Jason and Jim touched on a variety of things. Let me just expound on uh, a few of them and then turn it over to Bob to facilitate questions or dialogue because um, I know you know I know people uh, have a finite amount of time. Um, the gas tax, the municipal gas tax, uh, is a bill that um, I have filed numerous times, uh, and uh, perhaps more importantly is a way of getting to floor files and amendment numerous times, uh, only to be turned back repeatedly because of an ongoing need to study the impacts uh, of doing away with the gas tax at the local level. And simply the argument I had is that we should treat it like a sales tax at the local level, that we don't need that transfer payment of money from the towns to the state to then turn around to get back to cities and towns. Um, I think one of the single biggest things that, that we can do, and I'm hopeful in the uh, new legislative session and new administration, that the commitment that the legislature made for a uh, Chapter 90 program of $300 million um, and included in their bond bill for $300 million is actually done instead of a $200 million program. Uh, that would mean um, I think a couple hundred thousand dollars more for the town of Reading to put into their program, and I'm sure like most of the towns I represent, uh, the DPW director maybe has a map on his wall about um, must do, need to do, should do, want to do streets. And probably like most of my towns, the town of Reading has jumped into the breach and maybe added some of their own resources to try to uh, expand that list. Um, and I think that's an area where we can and should do better. Uh, Jim touched on local aid. And I agree that the local aid number should be available. Uh, through the rules process, uh, I've tried repeatedly to put in our rules that we would have a local aid resolution that constitutes a floor. So that in under a worst case scenario, um, this is the least you would get from the state. And ideally, once we get into the budget process a little deeper at the state level, maybe we could build upon that floor. 
um, only again to un unfortunately be frequently rebuffed on that attempt. Uh, but as Jim said, this year we were, we did step to the plate and did a resolution in March. Um, we tried to move that resolution a little further uh, on two fronts. We tried to do a little more in Chapter 70, I think there was a 25 per people. We tried to move to 50, which was what actually I think MMA wanted. Um, but we also tried to move forward on the what we call the UGA, or Unrestricted Local Aid number. And we tried to move up $75 million. The proposal was to go up $25 million. And our basis to go up the other 50 was that if you look at the revenue that is coming in from the uh, state lottery, and you subtract out the, the prizes, administrative costs, the amount that goes to compulsive gaming, uh, and I think cultural council, um, you can determine that the state is um, setting aside, uh, some people would say skimming off the top, um, <laughs> originally 75 and now $50 million. And I, I would only offer as validation for that is that if you look, you will have seen recently that the treasurer's office talked about what a, what a great year the lottery had. We took in more money. It's great, 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 great. You're going to see none of it, most likely, um, unless next year we move that $25 million increase further. And I'm a believer that the lottery was created uh, ultimately to provide resources to cities and towns, and I think we need to get back to fulfilling that commitment. So I think Chapter 90 and the lottery are two areas that are pretty straightforward um, that we could take some strides in moving forward. Jason touched on the Foundation Budget Review Commission. Uh, congratulations to him on his work for that. We, a lot of us have had our, our, our shoulder to that uh, wheel for a while, and we're hopeful the commission has had their, some of the appointments, if not all of them done, and we'll get to work, and, and we'll start to hopefully see some benefits from that. Um, I think Jim and Jason touched on some of the programs out there uh, that are potentially available for grants. I think we have had some success uh, over the years, um, and you know, can think of many, uh, the Matera property, let's say, being one, where, and I'm very fond of the partnerships that we've been able to achieve with the town of Reading, where potentially sometimes it's town money or it's local money partnered with state money, um, because I think that shared partnership is a great model to go forward, and we can point to numerous project after numerous project, the lights are probably down at the, at the field right now um, as one of those partnership examples. Um, and I think that we can identify programs that maybe you can apply for, but I would also maybe like uh, through the chair and, and to maybe identify needs in the community that we can kind of come up with the laundry list and say, can we find programs that we can match or maybe find one-offs that we can work on um, and work and find out how we can achieve those. Because I, I would uh, say I think we've achieved a level of success uh, you know, Jason touched on the $1.5 million that we put in the, the bond bill. Fortunately, we didn't have to wait for the bond bill to get that project done. Because uh, in fairness, bond bills are borrowed money and um, I think are a great way of establishing um, a laundry list of priorities and continuing discussion. Um, but I'm always reticent to you know, say that sho uh, you know, shovel ready. That uh, takes a lot of time and changing administration can prioritize capital projects and, um, you know, circumstances intercede to affect that. But, so I'm very happy that, uh, as I recall, we had a meeting in the field on a day that was, on a, on a day temperature-wise, it was much like this last Saturday, it was about 95, uh, up in the home parking lot with District 4 and talking about that project. And I think they said if we'd let them go, they'd get it done because it was too hot, so it worked out. Um, so again, that's a success where community advocacy and I think partnering with, uh, with us and your town officials was able to achieve a positive result. Um, I won't say it's as timely as I would like to have had. It was a bit of a source of frustration. Fortunately, I think the solution wasn't as complicated as originally some people at the state thought it needed to be. Uh, and occasionally that's one of the frustrations I have with state government is that we think the solution to a problem needs to be more complicated than actually the problem itself is. Um, so that being said, Mr. Chairman, through you, we're happy to take questions or respond uh, specifically to anything you'd like to or, or on the list or not. I grab the microphone. Sure. So, we have some I can still, I can yell loud enough. That's mm -hmm. occupation yeah. questions from the audience. I'll start. Oh, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I just have an informational question. When we are able to identify uh, special programs, state programs to help with particular projects, uh, does that create a, a separate additional reporting requirement? Is that, does it usually do that? Or is, or is it just... It, 
Yes, I, I, I would say most likely yes. Usually when there's an agreement, there's a contract executed. Um, some programs can be done as a reimbursement, some can be done as a, when we did Summer Avenue a few years ago, it was done as what's called a force account, which basically the town's given the money and um, spend the money, but then there has to be an accounting for, you know, did we, did we give you road money and find out it was spent on whatever else, you know, maybe. So that some of it's just an accounting. Um, fortunately, the state controller lives here in the town of Reading, so he does a pretty good job <laughs> making sure we uh, do what we're supposed to do. Should we care if casinos get repealed or passed? Um, I would only, and again, I, I, I apologize for, for jumping in, only to the extent that the FY15 budget is predicated on some casino revenue coming in. Coming in. Um, however, revenue through the first two months is, is up by an amount about equivalent to replace that, you know, barring any you know, supplemental budgets, which obviously will occur. Um, so yeah, the, you know, the, the, there potentially is some concern about what that is. There's also money set aside that would go to local roads. So people need to factor that into their decision making when they when they get to the ballot. And, uh, this fall, just the funding with the educational funding, with the, with the casinos, the casinos goes and uh, all that money that was budgeted for, uh, you know, for cities and towns for education especially, and uh, uh, is, is going to be affected. There's no question about it. Um, Jason mentioned the uh, Community Preservation Act, and we did consider that a few years ago, and at the time there were concerns about the state keeping up their end of the funding in terms of the matching funds. Could you kind of update us on how that's worked out? Yes. Um, so when the program was initi initially um, implemented, I think it was in around 2000, um, definitely predates my time in the legislature, but the match at that time on the state funds was 100% match, so it was a great deal for every dollar put in of local money it was matched you know one to one that did go down over time as more communities joined the program and also when we went through the recession obviously there were fewer um, um, house sales so there was less money being paid into the um, their uh, I think that uh, re registered deeds right, piece, right which is the which is the source of the, the pool that the state uses to match so that had led to a situation several years ago where the program was seeming to stall out so this, I alluded to this, but the legislature um, uh, uh, look, took a look at that and did a number of things to strengthen the program. One of them is that, that now the legislature, and this is two years running and we expect, there's no guarantee, but we expect this will continue, has al appropriated $25 million out of the surplus at the end of the year from the state budget toward the CPA fund. So that's additional money to supplement the, the registry of deeds fees. Um, so as a result of that, um, the match the last couple of years has been in the 40 to 50 cent range. So I don't think we'll ever get back to the one to one, but you know, even if you're in a 25 cents, 30, 40, you know, that's still a pretty good return on your dollar. You're not gonna get any kind of return like that anywhere else. In addition, two other changes that were made that I think make the, I think would make the program more attractive to Reading, maybe compared to when you evaluated several years ago. One is, the, originally, you could only use CPA money for brand new um, recreational <coughs> projects. Um, that's well and good if you're like a you know, community that's building out still, but if you're built out the way the communities are around here, you have your ball fields, you have your playgrounds, you don't need that, you need to renovate them. And now you can do that. So now you can use CPA funds to go to a, a playground or a, or a ball field and that needs you know, improvement and maintenance. The other change is that in addition to the property tax surcharge that is the main source of local money, other sources of funding can go into the local CPA fund and be matched by the state dollars. So for example, other sources of local revenue can go in there, private money can go in there. So if there's a group in town that's raising money for a project, that, let's say they raise $25,000, if they choose to donate that to the CPA fund, then the state will match that money also. Um, up to, there's a limit, up to a limit. But that means there's some additional opportunity to get more state uh, matching funds. Um, so there's some things that have been done to make the program more attractive. There, you know, it still does require the voters to approve um, you know, a, a minimum of a 1% uh, surcharge on their property taxes. 
you can um, have exemptions for C, you know, um, for lower income people. You can have exemptions for the first 100,000 of property value. There are ways to mitigate the impact on seniors, for example, um, but obviously it does require the support of the community. Just, if I might, uh, Mr. Chairman, just to expand on that, the, the piece about allowing an alternative uh, funding at the local level um, was actually a piece that I had uh, proposed to put in there. I worked with Steve Kulik on this, and I was very fortunate. Um, there was a, a, a lot of reticence on the part of the speaker because you, there was originally a proposal to increase the fee, courting fee, and that was viewed as a tax, so we created this reversion piece, uh, which they're historically reversions, and, and, and that kind of met a broader uh, level of uh, legislative acceptance. But I would say, and I mentioned the Matera property earlier, that was the impetus for the idea that if a community outside of the 1%, and I know Bill Brown's blood pressure is probably going up back here talking about CPA. <laughs> um, uh, if I get anything wrong, I'm sure I'll jump in. Um, but, but Mr. Burbank's generosity was the idea that if a community had um, alternative means of coming up with funding, uh, outside of what they would get from this, wh why shouldn't that be eligible? And that, so I would say that was an example of something that happened within the, the community of Reading that led to uh, an impact on legislation in, in, a, in a general sense. Uh, and Jason's right, well, you know, obviously well, I think one of the things a lot of towns got to, particularly recreational, is that now you can use it for uh, capital. So you can't use it to do the routine maintenance in terms of we're gonna mow, mow the fields um, or the watering bill, but if we're putting in a new irrigation system, um, so there was some modifications, uh, and again, we did that in 2012, and I think with the FY13 budget, um, we've done the 25 million in place for the, for the first year and the second year. Uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it's worked out well, we got that uh, back up. If the real estate market continues certainly better now than it was a couple years ago, that will see hopefully some of the money be restored, some of that floor come back up a little bit. Um, I know Reading was one of the first communities to consider doing it, decided not to. Middleton was one of the other first communities to decide to do it and has done it and has had it for many, many years. And in fact, uh, a large portion of their initial money was used to fund their uh, library, which was a historic building. Mr. Brown. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. Uh, we are Definitely in need of a new cemetery building. You guys got a million and a half laying around? Because uh, we can't go to our constituents. They're deadbeats. <laughs> but they're very quiet. <laughs> I'm well behaved. Um, I am ecstatic, was ecstatic, to learn that there's a review commission for Chapter 70 Foundation Formula Review. I understand that the commission is scheduled by June to make um, yes. recommendations. How can we, as um, a school committee member or members of the public, learn about the work of the commission as it goes on over the next nine months? Yeah, so I'm great. I'm so glad to hear that your enthusiasm for it. I will certainly share that. Um, you understand, obviously, firsthand how challenging this is and why the foundation budget needs to be reviewed and updated. So the, uh, in statute that we, the legislature, passed and, uh, and the governor signed, it, the commission is required to have a minimum of four public hearings um, around the state. So we will be publicizing that, and uh, so it'll be an opportunity for our school committee members, board of selectmen, or anyone in the, in the public to attend, to give uh, testimony, and uh, provide information. And of course, um, you know, anyone who wants to share information uh, you know, at, at any time can share that with one of us and we'll be sure to get that to the uh, commission members. Um, I've also put in a, fish, a formal request to, to be a member of the commission. Um, it's up to the uh, Senate President and the Speaker of the House to make the appointments, but, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that I might, might be appointed. Other questions from the audience? Yes, I'm not sure if uh, you have any update or any idea about this, but I've been sort of following a special commission that was created by the legislature a couple of years ago, and it was, it's chaired by Pat Jalen and James O'Day, and it's to investigate elder protective services and make some recommendations because there have been a lot of problems, very similar problems to some of what I'm reading about the DCF, and Division of uh, Children and Families. And I was wondering, there was a rough draft that I saw in the fall of last year, but Nothing's come out since then, and I'm, I was really amazed to listen to candidates last night and 
not hear anyone who talked about elder issues because we've got all the baby boomers moving in to 60 and over, you know, and, and I didn't see that on the radar screen of anybody, Republicans or Democrats. And I was wondering, what do you see in the new, uh, in, the, in the next season of, of bills and things? And also, have you heard anything about this special commission? And, and other, anything coming out? We, we've spoken about this yeah, we, we've many, tried. many, many times. And I can tell you, I did, uh, I did speak to Representative O'Day towards the end of the session. And uh, the commission's in place, but unfortunately haven't met. So I've been get, get, had a guarantee and uh, some input that uh, the commission will be meeting in this coming session, at the beginning of the session. Hopefully something will be done halfway through the next session. Well, the commission's already met and yeah. written a report. Right. But the report hasn't been released. So. That's right. There's no follow-up on that report as yet. They haven't even released it, yeah. Right. Okay, well, I'm just wondering, it's been sitting there, we've been waiting, <laughs> and nothing's happened, so. Okay, so you think something will happen? I think so, I've spoken to him about the report. Yeah, okay. Well, and I would add also, Representative Dwyer has been, you know, has been a real champion on uh, issues of uh, elder home care services mm -hmm. and um, protective and uh, protective services, and this is actually an area, as you probably know, in the state budget, as the revenues have recovered, we have really focused on trying to improve the funding, um, particularly for home care, um, for you know, elders and people with disabilities and protective services because right. it is such a it is such a growing problem, um, unfortunately. Particularly financial exploitation. Right. right. As as a gratuitous plug, we'll be hosting the uh, mm -hmm. senior Thanksgiving dinner for right, the seniors. <laughs> <laughs> in, in no don't worry, they, they won't be exploited by the. No, no, there's, there's, no there's no charge. So we can't you know we can't we can't do any better than that. I'd like to ask a, a quick question. One of the, the items that we brought up on our, on our list here, Reading has had a, a tremendous history of being very proactive in terms of looking at opportunities, looking at programs, taking the lead. Jason, you brought up OPEP as an example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've done some proactive things with OPEP. Some communities have done a lot more. I think most have done a lot less. I think one of the things, I'll speak as, as current chair of FinCom, one of the things we hate to see is all of our good efforts go to waste because somebody comes through and through the legislature or whatever and says, well, we're just gonna take care of everybody. We're gonna kinda of take care of the problem so that this community will have made some sacrifice in the meantime and then everybody kinda of gets you know, carte blanche and, and you know, we were proactive and got rewarded by you know, getting the hook. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Are there ways, you know, we think it's good to be proactive. We like doing it, we've had great success, great results. How do we kinda of make sure that we're we're not kind of hung out to dry from doing that kind of stuff. Um, I would say it's a good question. I would say with the magnitude of the OPEP problem, the likelihood the legislature is going to come and backfill everybody's problem at the local level is zero. Mm -hmm. I don't think we could create enough printing presses to solve the problem at the state. Um, I think it's a valid concern because I know Reading originally was a, well, a print community, and the deal was some of the you know, some of the obligation we paid, we fought for that for years, got some of the money in some instances, but it, it is a valid concern. Um, and it, I, I think it's one that we just have to keep, be watchful for and, and try to make a case that if, and I think this may relate maybe very heavily to the MWRA issue that was on the agenda, that if um, there's going to be a change in policy, there's a way to try to backfill as best we can with communities that maybe were proactive um, or, or, or did the right thing sooner. Um, you know, but we have to just keep a watchful eye for that. I, I don't think with OPEP that, that it's probably as likely to be an issue just because it's such a big number and I mean I, I, would, I would like to think if, if we find that kind of money that we would we would take care of the 50 million dollars in the lottery we take care of the 100 million dollars chapter 90 and do a lot of those things first yeah I would agree I think it's less likely on open because I think it's more going to be changes in terms of the rules around you know and if some communities have already done that you know right, in terms of um, um, you know in providing more flexibility at the local level but I, but I think the larger point you're making is around you know, this issue if you've been good stewards, you know, and responsible community, not being penalized for that. And it reminds me of um, um, when I first was um, elected, uh, elected to the uh, House of Representatives uh, 2000, I took office in 2008, and I think it was the, one of the very first uh, caucuses that I was in. Um, you know, before you get to the floor and debate legislation, you, you caucus um, and you discuss it. And, um, and I was very intimidated, you know, it was one of my first ones, and as a freshman legislator, you're basically supposed to keep your mouth shut and, and just listen. And uh, the Speaker of the House at the time was, um, this was right when we went into the Great Recession, and they were talking about 9C cuts. You know, these, you know how bad these are, right? This is when the budget is cut and local aid is cut, 
in the middle of the year, so as, as bad as it is to get less at the beginning, it's even worse in the middle. And they were, there was a discussion about um, communities being penalized that had been responsible and had larger stabilization funds, you know, had built up their rainy day fund, and that they were actually, gonna, and, and it happened at that time I represented my hometown, Winchester, who had been very responsible and had actually built up a large rainy day fund. And I remember standing up to argue that that was unfair, that they shouldn't be penalized just because they had been responsible, you know, in tough times and had put, you know, put money away to save bad times. Um, I'm not sure how well that went over, um, but... Um, well, they kept into the Senate, so the yeah. 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 <laughs> So, the uh, little well, anecdote, but you know, I think the point's well taken that we, you know, I agree with you, the principle that we should be very aware of that and not, not through our actions, cause communities, therefore, to make irresponsible decisions. Other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, this question is for Jason, I believe. But um, as you know, all the communities in the whole state is having um, increasing issues with substance abuse, prescription drug abuse, opiates, whatever. Um, and a lot of us have received federal grants in the past, Reading has received, and we're applying again for another federal grant, but those are extremely competitive um, with a lot more, more and more communities applying for them. Do you see any um, increase in state grant available to help those of us that don't have federal grants? Um, you know, Brad, you can probably speak to this also, um, but I, I, are, you, are you referring to a grant that the Reading Substance Abuse Coalition received, right? These were the, the right. federal grants. Um, uh, they had sort of a, what was it, a 10-year limit on them, I think. Well, there was we had a, a, there we had was a, a time frame around those. We had one DFC grant for yeah. five years. We can apply for one more, and we've applied several times. Yes. And actually, we're waiting to hear um, on the one that we applied for. We should be hearing any day. But Okay. We should talk maybe offline about that. And one of the things you know we would want to do is make sure we, we support the grant application um, you know as much as we can. Uh, it is true, I think, you know, we've seen what's happening in the federal government and how broken things are there, so that, that trickles down. And we have seen some of those grants that substance abuse coalitions have relied on, you know, dry up. I think at the state level, um, this, this budget, we really did, yes, this uh, current budget has a very significant increase in, in funding through the Department of Public Health for substance abuse. Now, it goes for a range of different services and programs. I can't tell you off the top of my head how much is directly available to you know substance abuse coalitions, um, but we can we can get you that. I, I would say that just at, in, the, in the general topic of the grants, if if the community uh, through the school side, general side is going to apply, um, it is always helpful if a copy of the application request, <coughs> particularly in this day of email and PDFs, it's pretty easy to do, is given to us uh, occasionally. In some of the communities I represent, you know, there's a request made in and find it almost at the point when it maybe does, isn't successful that, that the application was made. Um, and it doesn't mean that, that we'll, if we're notified that we'll be able to make sure that it happens, but it means maybe we're in a position to help out. Okay. Yep. So I think, um, you know, I think the good news is there, there is, a, well, the bad news is how bad the problem is. The good news is there's a growing recognition that we have to do better. And that does require, it's not just money, there's different approaches and different strategies, but some of it is also having the funding um, in the communities to address the educational needs, the prevention needs, and the treatment needs. So but come join us on, uh, in October, because I think we'll have, we'll have a great discussion on, on other ideas for uh, you know, addressing the epidemic. Other questions? Last call? Super, all right, thank you guys very much for, for that sort of thing. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit here. And our focus goes to kind of continuing the discussion that, that uh, these gentlemen just laid out for us. But we want to talk tonight about revenue sources. So if the first financial forum was about community priorities, what things we want to be uh, focusing our, our revenues on, now we need to talk about, okay, how do we generate those revenues? So clearly there are, you know, we know that we have our, our traditional sources, we have property taxes and things that come through. We've been very successful with the meals tax in terms of creating a new source of revenue. Um, but I think what we want to do is to lay out for you kind of the framework that we're operating under. I'll give you a little bit of that picture before. 
here's where we are now, and kind of here's where things are headed. So cash reserves likely are going to be adequate or strong. We should have free cash certified in October-ish? November-ish? It's a few weeks? Okay. So at some point we'll kind of see what the what the official numbers are. Um, there's still you know some reserves that, that are in place. But that said, our operating budgets as they are, and as was, was outlined by Bob, they can't be sustained going forward at the current service levels. So quite specifically, if we're relying on only the current sources, the community will have to make some priority decisions on what services they want and don't want. The other side of that coin is to look also at, are there some new sources of funding that can be brought in? And you know, at the end of the day, obviously, it's a balancing act between those things that can happen. Our mission tonight, and um, what we'll probably do is we use, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see the chart here, beautiful. We'd like to solicit your guys' opinions, your guys' thoughts on what ideas there may be for um, increasing revenues, for finding revenues within the town. In the past, there have been ideas related to um, real estate activities, sale of real estate. We've talked about looking for grants and activities. We've had some discussion about state aid. Obviously, we'd love more whenever we can get it. Um, there may need to be a community discussion about uh, an override to take place as well. Um, it's been more than 10 years since the last one. Um, it may be that that's something that would need to be talked about. And our purpose tonight is, is not to be deciding what's going to happen or not going to happen, but to solicit everybody's input and ideas. How can we best kind of work with this? What we'd like to do is if we can generate uh, a list of some of these ideas, then get some feedback some, from some folks in terms of priorities as they see them, what ideas they think are, are worth pursuing further versus others that aren't. We did the same thing about four years ago, five years 2008. ago? 2008. 2008. Really? Um, and we came up with a number of different ideas. Uh, you know, cell tower contracts, a number of different things, and at the end of the day, um, you know, they brought in some funds for the town, which is great. And again, our goal here is to get some ideas, see what they might be, um, and then talk them through. And then obviously, you know, through the elected officials of the town, through the different boards and activities, those can be part of the discussion that takes place. So, that said, Anyone want to start out with an idea? Elaine. So I have a question because I'm just trying to like wrap my mind around um, these numbers that Bob put up for uh, potentially next year with the um, so if I understood that right, um, even using one point seven million in um in that, uh, we would end up with only point eight percent budget increases for the town and schools. So in terms of you know numbers of what you have to cut, if you're going to support the salary increase, I think, right? Is it, is it, does it look like that in order to support that, you're going to have to like, cut some other places to support that salary increase? Or is it, is it like a, then the, if the salary increases are 2% and you've got 8% increase, is that you've got to find the equivalent of 1.2% someplace else to come out of your budget? And so you can support that salary increase. And I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. So, that quickly during math to, to give me the idea of how much we would have to cut in terms of programming or, or teachers or, um, yeah, that's it, programming teachers. And, you know, same thing on the municipal side, what we're saying. Um, traditionally, at this time of year, we're in a bit of a hole to some degree. Um, if you want to look at it, if we were not using any free cash at all, um, and you wanted to have a 3% operating budget, which is typically what we strive for, three and a half is better, but three, we're about $3 million in the hole right now. We're, we're always in the hole this time of year when we're looking forward. That process gets much more refined as we go through the winter. Um, this is one of the larger holes that I remember seeing for 15 years. Um, typically a million and a half, a million point eight this time of year is not that unusual. It's a little bit worse this year, and I, I would have to say, uh, a big driver, Dr. Dory and I were in a meeting on health insurance premiums. That's that's the single biggest problem, I guess you would say. Um, it, we're again going out to bid this fall, so we don't know what the results would be. Um, I had been thinking six or seven percent would be very difficult to live with. We're budgeting 14 now, based on the actual market conditions. So, um, if today's numbers don't change at all. You'll be right. If you have a 2% obligation to pay people and you have less money than that, you have to have less people if nothing else being equal. 
So that's part of the reason why we want to start this list, is to see if we can find some other opportunities that we haven't thought of. Again, in the past, when we did in 08, a number of opportunities did come up, and, and the community was able to pursue some of them. Others, uh, the community decided they didn't want to pursue. But okay. we'd like to come up with, with ideas. Okay, it's just helpful for me to take that percentage of the dollars that we have to make decisions on. Thank you. Just for clarity's sake, the three million that were in the hole is assuming 14% increase in uh, health insurance. Correct. Right. That's, that's built in. Right. And again, unfortunately, that's the number we don't know. We'll know sooner this time. We'll know by January. Correct. And we'll be welcome to the budget process by that time. Other clarification questions before we go? Sure. Just to interrupt, I'm sorry for a minute. We had a couple of members coming late, so I need to call the library board in order. Thank you. Okay. Ideas. What what might we do? Please. Mark, is there, um, I noticed the, uh, the idea of the split tax rate. I know it's uh, a little bit of a hot button in this town, but it's not on your list. Is there uh, an opportunity to take another look at that? I mean, I, I know that looking at the other towns around us, towns that ourselves to, the towns we aspire to, the, the split tax rate, a lot of them are, have thriving business communities with the split tax rate. I think it's something that it's not a slam dunk, I mean, it's a way to kind of modulate it, but I think it's something that we're looking for revenue we have to put on the table, so it's for conversation. Absolutely. We were, uh, we're blessed with um, wonderful residents and not a lot of businesses, more and more, but that doesn't really increase the uh, tax head. That just reallocates who pays it. Ah. That does increase your So the budgets don't go off at the end of the day. Sit towns like Burlington, cities like Uber, have 50% more of their real estate in the commercial category. And it works in that situation. You go and do penalize, you know, if it's a dollar, often a dollar down. Here it would be a a dollar. I don't want to get into a, a, a technical issue of tax policy, but I'm willing to pay the taxes that I have today or potentially more, should the case may be. The question is, is there a way to harvest more taxes from the commercial side of the town? I mean, it, it's, it's something, I, I don't want to take it off the table. I don't think it's, a, it's an issue that should be taken off has um, gone out and hired a health insurance consultant, independent consultant, and all those options are on the table. Um, one of the reasons for the increase is we've been in Maya for a long time, and we're getting a good deal. Other ideas, please. spending a little more up front in order to save a little more in the long run. So roofs becoming solar or uh, recycling water. I know that the Bancroft School in Andover has built itself to be green and self-sustaining over time. And that maybe as our, some of our capital issues come up that we could consider applying to the Green Communities Program and investing that way so we can save money over time. Andy doing a good thing. Thank you. Other ideas? Oh, I'm sorry. Paul? Um, I don't think I need my phone either, but I think we should put CPG 
EPA on the list because, you know, with the flexibility now in the spending, those are areas we're spending money on now. We might as well, you know, look to get some return for some of our tax dollars that we aren't. So this is the Community Preservation Act that, we're, yeah. that was being discussed before. <clears throat> okay. uh, Mark, uh, this may be a bit of a sales pitch for RMLD, but we have some of the lowest electricity rates uh, in the Commonwealth. And so that is an asset that can be used to attract businesses that may rely on that electricity. There's a residual benefit um, for us because uh, right now what's happening is that this load is declining um, and people are becoming more conservation oriented, which is an incredibly good thing. And devices are becoming much more efficient. Uh, RMLD is looking at declining revenues. And one way to counteract that, to keep the organization healthy, is to make sure that we're we're uh, expanding load. One way to do that is through the right kinds of businesses. And so I just throw it out to the group as we talk about businesses, um, those that may benefit from incredibly low cost electricity may be very beneficial, mutually beneficial for them. So kind of an economic uh, development incentive that's built in, you just have to have it done. Maybe there's some way to build that into a way to approach the right kinds of businesses or the kinds of businesses the town would want to see. Maybe I'll throw heresy out just for a second. Is it possible that, that our money could be selling to other communities or other areas? Uh, tricky. Uh, you know, there's, there's some tricky things about that. Um, but, but there's lots of options within how you grow the, the organization. Thank you. Uh, more new growth. Reading is generally a built out community in terms of empty land. Uh, but uh, anytime this redevelopment, whether it's a single family home, redeveloping and remodeling, or much more importantly, a business doing that, it adds revenue. And that's, if you will, free money. That's a new source of revenue that then is subject to the two and a half every year. Um, Reading historically in the last decade or so has new growth around half a million dollars, sometimes a little lower. When the landfill was developed, it was over a million dollars for a couple of years in a row. So not only is it the million dollars that you see that first year, that million goes on forever, if you will. And one of the areas that some of the communities around us are seeing a lot of new growth in, that Reading hasn't done that well in is personal property tax, especially by luring technology companies into that. Because technology companies don't have big factories, big infrastructure, but what they have inside those walls can be taxed as personal property. So new growth is definitely an opportunity to do something. Other thoughts, mm -hmm. ideas? Lynn? Do you know override get on the list or not? Sorry, uh, which one? It needs to get on the list. Did override get on the list? Uh, yeah. So I think it's been, isn't it close to 13 years? That was 2004. Four. Four. Three. Three. Yes, yeah, sir. Right. Well. And before that, it was at least 10 years prior to that. It was 1993. Well, again, so ten of years. My predecessor said every ten years, but then he forgot a couple of years. Well, I, I think that the point is when we were, and I'm probably many of us were here for that override ten years ago, and you know we certainly had gotten to a point where I can recall town meeting discussions or community discussions that, that were. You know, we can't let it get to this point again. It does too much structural damage. And if I did the round numbers right, who can maybe be looking at a more the $885,000 budget cut for that year? That is enormous. Talk about pain. We're, we're in pain and receiving feedback about some of the cuts that we had to make this year. And this, that fails in comparison to what this Feel like, and I think if you did the same round numbers for the municipal side, it's about maybe 450,000 or so. So I think it's really important to put numbers in your head and think about what that's going to mean and going to look like when we start to think about what kind of community we want and whether we are or aren't willing to pay to be that kind of community. And I, I, I remember living where we were 10 years ago. And um, you know, there, there, were a lot of, there were a lot of things that were on the priority list there. Um, so I know I'm, I represent the school committee, but it was on the priority list about early child 
childhood and, and full day K and achieving those goals, we're years away from that now. Um, and that's without doing something like this. You know, without looking at how do we, um, you know, avoid, I don't think we can avoid getting it pretty close to that position as we were 10 years ago. I think we're, we're pretty close. We're extremely fortunate that we have the free cash and that we do at least have the opportunity to consider using that to buffet this. But it scares the heck out of me to think we got an almost $2 million buffet and we still, you know, we got more than $1.2 million worth of potential cuts. One thing we should definitely put up here is um, sale and use of public land. So there are some undeveloped properties, there are opportunities potentially for reorganizing where things are. Uh, this not that much undeveloped land, but looking over to Gene, I know there are some properties that are just absolutely prime. Uh, and the whole RMLD and across the street area, there are a number of spots in town that could be very interesting for economic development that we need to be looking at. And it would be nice to use some economic development that actually brought the town correctly rather than not mm -hmm. just new growth. Mm -hmm. But we built some yeah. facilities that we lease out to people and then this money that comes right in. That's There's lots of demands. All the rep, all the expenditure ideas we have, so does everybody else. Everybody wants things. You know, if we had facilities to rent to people, as John well knows, uh, we could fill up buildings, we could fill up athletic fields uh, constantly. Yeah. Uh, if I could just expand on that, uh, I'm lost, I don't know my phone. Gene Delios, we are uh, in the process of embarking on an economic development action plan with the help from uh, our regional planning agency. And we were recently awarded some funding to begin that process to look at those priority development sites that we've already identified with the help of the Metropolitan Area Planning Council as a regional vision behind RMLD and um, some other sites that I know have been discussed for a variety of different elements for, for the community. And to now go, go back to those sites and think about what can go there, what, can, what is the maximum build-up potential residential and commercial, um, and how can we now bring sites closer to development? What do we need to do? Do we need to um, you know, market, partner? Uh, but what's the potential of these sites, and how can we see some activity? Not to mention, I'll make another plug, the zoning bylaw. For those of you who've been engaged, and I want to especially recognize Marcy as the chair of the Zoning Advisory Committee. Uh, one of the things that we heard when we had Professor Bluestone come and talk to us about uh, the economic development potential of the community is simplifying the regulations and explaining them and having checklists. And so that's something the Economic Development Committee as well as town staff are looking at a new guide for business. Um, and through the zone work of the Zoning Advisory Committee, we're uh, very pleased to be presenting a much more simple and easy to follow and easy to read zoning bylaw, but that will be in November, so uh, stay tuned for that. And there is a website if anyone's interested. Thank you. Thank you. Any <coughs> um, If folks have a handout from tonight, if you click to page seven, that's the list from 2008. Um, one of the ones that's on the agenda, Mark, although it's not born in new group is a cell tower. It's, there is a strong appetite for cell tower placement in Reading. Um, we have four or five companies right on the hook for just need to reel them in. Uh, so there's no revenue, well there's, there's some revenue from 20 years ago at a sort of lower level. There's a potential for increasing that. But again, we're only talking about 50 or 100,000 dollars more a year. It's not earth shaking, but it's not. Yeah, really what was the uh Approximate expression, a billion here, a billion there, after yeah, sure. talking about some real money. Yeah. Um, I'd like to put up um, private partnerships. And you know, Jason mentioned, you know, if it involves CPA or whatever, where they're matching funds. But thinking about where there are facilities or opportunities where we could get private grants from private companies that would be willing to sponsor uh, different activities. In other words, it's kind of cutting our costs, if you will, but it's not spending, I guess I'm going to put on the revenue side as a possibility. Mm -hmm.
Maybe you're ready with an idea, no? No, I'm just trying to make sure nobody needs to have Answer. Um, I'd like to put up um, looking at consolidating further services. Sorry, that, consolidating? Consolidating. <coughs> further consolidation yes. services. Yes, I mean, it's worked very well with uh, public health, with, with Sherry Drew, and I'm wondering if we can look at some other ways of consolidating and even looking at if there's areas that, um, <coughs> in any department, that um, we can consolidate management. <coughs> Jason, did you mention mass in motion? Is that yes, some type of yes. public health that might be an opportunity that we could look at? Yes. Well, actually, the mass in motion grants were just awarded, and um, Reading was not included because of, um, well, for a lot of reasons. So, the Melrose Wakefield has a mass in yep. motion grant, but Reading does not, and, and won't for the foreseeable future because. The grant, the grants are just awarded. Yeah, but is it something we might be able to address in the future? Um, uh, cost. Yeah, yeah. Cost. Cost. yeah. We're yeah. trying to keep ourselves focused on everything. If I can just yeah. address Nancy's point, um, one of the working groups the selectmen have formed has that as one of their tasks: is to look at existing regionalization, future regionalization, and regionalization doesn't have to mean other towns. You can Schools, town, like department, departments within. So yeah, it's definitely being looked at. I had to finish up because I don't know, I feel like I have really a clear understanding of all of the, uh, the nuances involved. But I want to throw out the idea. I have an understanding or an impression, at any rate, that the um, the ice arena is not necessarily. <coughs> My understanding is the ice arena uh, might have a potential, but we had a situation in past years where it was to some extent a revenue source for the town, and that is diminished over time. I'm not clear in the particulars. However, I think it's something that's worth looking at. And I just want to kind of throw it out there as a topic for review because it's not a large dollar item, uh, but compared to um, citizens including you know the kids that use it and, you know, the adults that use it in red and so there's one 
implications to the revenue that can be driven out of those recreational opportunities. I mean, because what happens is you're providing services. Now, that doesn't mean there can't be an expansion of those kinds of services and other recreational opportunities. And part of what we heard tonight about potential funding to grow recreational opportunities could create revenue streams. And then if you tie that back to one of the original bullet points from the last meeting, that was a high priority in the group. So there's, there's some potential for, you know, kind of killing several birds with one stone here. That, um, you know, where you can create revenue streams, you know, create solutions to questions that people have raised from a recreational standpoint. And it sounds like there may be some state partnership money that could be available, but I guess that's going to require that, you know, we adopt CPA as a, as a way. And there's cost to do business in that, you know, for each of our cities. So all of that, I think in the strategic planning process that we're undergoing, I think a lot of that's going to be revealed um, as far as the potential is concerned. I mean, things like the ice cream, and I, at the Bob's point, and I think it's something everybody really needs to understand, and I, I'm, I'm close to it because I, that's one of my liaison responsibilities to select. Um, the capital expenses recently have been low. Start to take care of things like being sure there's a girls' locker room, go along with boys' locker room. That's not inexpensive. And so it really cuts into the you know, potential revenue streams that you can take out of it when they're maintaining the, you know, they have to maintain that capital. Right. As long as we're talking about investigating different options, one that comes up and that should come up here again is um, on the RMLD side. Um, are there potential additional opportunities for the town to? collect additional funds. And, and again, obviously there are issues with um, their goal is to minimize rates. Um, but it's worth something, it's worth investigating. Parking fees. Parking fees. People parking fees. This town wait till gets a dollar a day. Down in the green section. If you don't pay a dollar, you get a ticket. Conferences, the Blue Ribbon Conference, drawing um, the band competitions. There have been other sort of regional events that have been drawing other people into town to spend money in our businesses to pay for our facilities. And I don't know what space is left. I'm not speaking just about the schools, but we have facilities, and I wonder if we could draw some more businesses through conferences um, and cut down on our own costs and build our own connections through more hosting of those kinds of events. And maybe that might even attract businesses like technology businesses to town if we have the facilities to, to host conferences. Maybe uh, Bob, we can even expand beyond facilities rentals. It's almost an event planning. Yeah, so not that we're going to be throwing weddings and things, but. <laughs> Marketing. 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 Marketing.
talking with Terry Kevin. Well, so I said it. This might be a controversial one from the school community's point of view, but uh, becoming a choice community for admitting out of town kids where a space allows you. From the kind of the prior list, maybe we should kind of call through a little bit and see if there's some others. Sponsorships. So the idea that um, you can sponsor different things, I mean, like benches or, or common and dumb, things like that. And I have huge sources, but not long. Um, things we've talked about for the last couple of years today. Um, there's certain things that Reddit is very good at. The often has to sell them to people who aren't as good. In terms of service. So that's regionalization except for charge. Uh -huh. So kind of teaching people how to do it. You know, we're put the municipality in a, a corporation, so there's a fine line there, but it does seem a shame, and you know, we see it all the time, just reinventing the wheel in 350 times. And it's just, it's really a shame. And then there's a whole industry sprung up to take care of those 350, which in some cases is not strictly necessary because we can help people do things. But there's lots of consultants in the state that will help 350 people 350 different times. Seems very inefficient in many areas, but I don't know how you turn that into the business of the municipality exactly. Ruth. Well, uh, just to follow up on that with Bob, um, it, it is kind of regionalization, but it's also revenue depends on how it's how it's framed because Melrose's IT department provide services to a number of other communities, it's, and the other communities pay Melrose. So it's, it's not really regionalization, it's a source of revenue. Yeah. So they're two different, they can be two different things. It's an ongoing process, it doesn't stop here. Um, but one of the things we wanted to do was to see, you know, if, if this is kind of a list of start, if there are certain ones that seem to have priority to the folks who are here. And what we can do is, is explore them in a little bit more detail to see what the opportunities really are and aren't. So um, we want to just try to take a vote, might that be the best way to do it? Um, we have the dots. We have dots. All right, even better. So what we're going to do is we're going to hang these up on probably on the whiteboard over here. We're going to give everybody three dots and ask you that way to only have three votes. And what you're voting for at this point is which ideas you'd like to see pursued, investigated for, not necessarily pursued, but investigated. So we understand what the implications would be of pursuing for now. So we'll hang these over here. Here are the dots.
So um, I think that's probably a manageable list that we can work on and start pursuing. So thank you for your, for your input. Um, we have one major other agenda item that I want to have, but before we do that, I just want to pause for a minute. Are there any questions, comments thus far, what we've talked about, kind of what we've done here? All good? All right, with that, let me ask uh, David Hutchinson to come up. Um, I have, there are some bullet points that you can use on this slide if you want to go down them, but I do want to steal your thunder. So. Oh, no, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mark. Uh, very brief update. I uh, just want to give you a qualitative update on the project and uh, and then a quick quantitative update. And I'll hit a certain level of detail where you can ask me anything you want. Um, but this, you should uh, find this unqualified good news. I hope so. Okay, so let's, let's set that back. Because um, we did have a little hiccup in Q1, as most of you are aware. Um, once we got that squared away, we've been working hard through the summer. So some things, we've, we've got a completed design, um, which is a beautiful library, uh, the building, hopefully all of you have seen the designs at the, the town fair or on the website or various presentations. So the this building design is done, including the addition. The site plan is done, we've been through CPDC, a little uh, compromising and wrangling there, but we've got a site plan that I think everyone can live with. Um, so that's completed. Um, the, uh, the final design is getting printed up, uh, hopefully next week, which will then feed into a bid process that we hope to start late next week. Then we, get, we have a few weeks, three weeks for the sub bids. All of our, uh, our contractors are pre-qualified now, so all the subcontractors as well as the general contractors are pre-qualified. So now it's just a mechanical thing that subs submit theirs, and then the GCs have another two weeks to submit. So we're hoping by the end of uh, mid to late October we can get um, we can get our final bids, take the best one from our qualified list, immediately thereafter sign a construction contract, which is technically when construction begins. So the project is well on its way. Um, if you have any questions or have a chance to look at the design, I think you'll like it, and everyone we've exposed it to seems to like it. Um, as far as the library itself, the program. We, uh, this, we have a signed lease, as you all know, I think it's over in one general way. The build-out is well underway. I think we're just posted some pictures. You can see forklifts and things going up. So we're hopeful that uh, that space will be very serviceable to the community for the approximately 16 months that we'll be over there. Um, if that gets built out on time, which we hope by the end of September, beginning of October, we hope to then have a brief shutdown of the library and then move over there, and once we're set up, um, two or three weeks, we'll open up for business there for the balance of the project. So that's in great shape. Um, and, uh, and I also do want to mention, thank the school system. Uh, the library is attempting during the 16 months where the temporary space continue all the programming that we do, but obviously the temporary space doesn't accommodate that kind of program space as much. Uh, the schools have been very generous in offering us a lot of uh, space and um, rooms to be able to continue a lot of the program, so we appreciate that. So this is a, clearly a town partnership um, throughout. Um, so I think that's the, the building and the, uh, and the temporary space. As far as the funding of uh, the, the finances, um, just recall we, 
the town in April approved an $18.4 million project. Uh, the state is going to contribute $5.1 million. Um, the state's already given us $2 million. We expect, um, once we sign this contract, we should be ready to apply for the third million. So we should have three million in pocket by, by Q4, um, uh, which is good, it's a good start. And I think Bob will, will uh, do a bond for the balance or the, the whole amount to cover it sometime in Q4 as well. So we'll start there. Um, of the 18.4, um, and the time we'll be contributing the 13.4 something, um, we, to date, we've only encumbered or contracted for two expense items, the two professionals, right? The architects, the professional, uh, the project manager, which was last fall. We haven't spent anything else. All the uh, spending today has just been against two fixed fee contracts. So we really haven't encumbered the project beyond those two yet. Um, all the activity during the summer was working the design to meet the $13.2 million construction budget that we have. So we wrestled with the architects and on the site plan and all that, they've now, um, the design does, according to the estimator, the design we have should price at 13.2 in the market. Now we'll find out in a month if they're right, but you know, we have three different professional advisors saying that this is the market rate for the, product, the design we're putting on the street. So we'll find out for sure, but um, you know, I'd be, well, we should all be disappointed if we're way over or something. We also might be pleasantly surprised and we might be under. Um, and the estimator does shoot for the middle range. So if we can get a little bit from a qualified bidder, we'll take that obviously. And we do have a few alternates, uh, meaning things that aren't in the base budget that we might be able to add, such as the innovation center. Um, and uh, the, the only other element of the budget really is the so-called soft costs, which are the furniture and the moving costs, which we pretty much get nailed down now because we have the lease space and the movers we've, I think, just issued a PO for, so we're ready to go there. So the only other element really to be vetted, which we'll start in on, is furniture and outfitting of the, the building, which will progress during the coming year, and then we'll get some visibility on that budget spend for that, but um, no reason to think we can't stay well within that. Um, but anyway, I think that's the update. It's the project, it's the money, it's all good news, we're right on, no reason to think we won't, we won't be. And we also should mention, because everyone's risk averse and nervous, we still have, um, in the construction, we still have 1.2 million of construction reserve or contingency. So that's likely to be used, but it may not be. And as the project progresses, we can dip in, in, dip into that. So that's a nine percent contingency. Any questions specifically to this? Okay, thank you. Thanks, David. Any final questions, comments? Yeah, Thanks. Actually, uh, I have a question. I was sort of reminded about this um, when I began in my mind. I talked about the um, you know the um, override in uh, 2003 versus where we are now. Um, Bob had um, numbers up about a pr proposal for how much free cash we could use, but I'd be really interested to sort of see what the um, status was of sort of free cash and stabilization at that time and where we are today to sort of be able to understand that time value view of money comparison to know, you know, because, um, and I know there's differences in our, our goals probably for those funds, so maybe that would be a good thing to um, also have. I'd just like to see that, and you guys probably have it, but. I think it's something we, we can certainly look at in terms of what kind of the comparables and what was going on. Um, we'll have a, a better idea of where our free cash stands soon. So that's good just to kind of start with that and, and see what, how that helps our assumptions. Um, but the likelihood is that, you know, if you were looking at this year, it looks like there's a reasonable cash balance sitting there. The problem is that it is, every time we put 1.7 million or whatever the number is, it just comes straight out, straight out, straight out. And that won't last very long at all. Just a couple of years, a couple of three right. years and it's done. Clearly we had done that kind of thing for quite a while, probably before we got to the point we were at in um, 2003. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, anyway, I didn't realize that. Like, completely different discipline set up then too. So um, I think, actually you probably know, like I thought we had less. Right. Yeah.
services do you provide, how much do you cut, how much, if you will, reckless financial spending behavior are you willing to do in order to make the point we need more money? That's a tough one. One of the other things we, we did, not we, but the town did back then, uh, a lot of projects were not uh, done adult. They weren't like a library space, the mentality back then was
all the different buckets. So there's stabilization funds, there's earmarked funds, there's free cash. That's the whole picture that we're going to be looking at, trying to understand, and just you know, make sure that we, we we have what we need. Um, you know, too much gives us opportunity, and, and you know, if it's not going to be regenerating into the system, that doesn't last long. Somewhere in between, we've got to go through it, we've got to plan. The point of this meeting, the reason why we're all here, is we're looking ahead a little bit. Uh, Bob brought up the idea of two-year budgets, which I think is a really interesting idea to pursue also, so that we can not just see what this year is, but what's the implication for next year as well. Um, and it's certainly worth kind of taking a look at that as an idea so that we can try to try to manage through it. You know, it, it, it's not chicken little today, um, but we want to be planning for what's going on. And you know, one of the things that you're probably seeing Seeing it, other people are seeing it. Is FinCom is trying to be a little bit more actively involved. And shoot, excuse me, I shouldn't say FinCom. FinCom and Board of Selectmen are trying to be much more actively involved in a lot of the activities going on in the town. Um, and just from the point of view of you know, being stewards of the town's money, um, you know, it's precious. Um, but there are things that this town wants to have on their priorities and sense. We need to figure out how to, how to do the best we can do. suddenly come down at the last minute, people are flooded with information, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, because we all know people don't react well with that. We need to get more people involved. Um, please, talk to people, invite them to the next forum, let them watch it on TV, let them participate. We need to make a presentation, at some point we should get on the agenda at town meeting to give them an update uh, on what's going on. The more information I think that we get out sooner, again, not chicken little stories, but here's what's happening, here's how we're planning it, here's what we're looking at, I think the better off we're all gonna be in terms of really hitting the town's priorities as best we can. With that, I'm gonna close the meeting, say thank you very much everybody for coming. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, finance committee, if you can hang for a few minutes, we have a couple of matters just to deal with, but thank you all for coming. <laughs>